Hey world, Dan Brown here with another edition of EDH Rec Tech, the Magic the Gathering deck building show about the variant Elder Dragon Highlander, where we use the popular online deck building resource known as EDH Rec, uh, and take a look at a given commander's signature cards. That is to say, cards that are disproportionately prevalent in the 99 of a given commander's uh, crowdsourced decks. EDH Rec has thousands of deck lists um, that it is sourcing from to get this data. And uh, what I do is I look at the signature cards and I tell you my opinions as to uh, what the masses seem to be doing well and where the masses seem to be leading the masses astray. Whether or not I like the cards, this show up in the signature cards for a given commander this week. We'll be looking at Ural the Mist Stalker. Costs two red, green, white. We call that Naya. He is a legendary creature, as they all are, a beast. He cannot be the target of spells or abilities your opponents control. That has been errated. It, it now just says hexproof. A lot simpler. Ural gets plus two, plus two for each aura attached to it on a 5-5 five, five body. Uh, so built-in protection that gets big quick. The one thing he's missing is evasion, but hopefully the auras attached to it will grant some form of evasion. Uh, speaking of which, uh, these are the signature cards for Ural. You can see that they range from a 77%. Oh, I guess that's not the number of decks it's in. I guess that's just some arbitrary metric called synergy that I don't know quite what it means. Um, I could email them and figure it out probably, but I'll do that later. <laughs> uh, all right, let's, let's get it, let's jump in. Uh, Shield of the Oversoul. Uh, enchantment Aura, as long as Enchanted Creature is green, it gets plus one, plus one, and is indestructible. As long as it is white, it gets plus one, plus one, and has flying. So there's the evasion we've been looking for. In total, this would give Ural plus four, plus four, making it a nine, nine flying indestructible for just one aura on, on turn six, presumably, if we're on curve. Turn five, if we've ramped a little bit, maybe even turn four. Have a very, very scary threat attacking on turn five, six, or seven. Um, the one word of caution, I would have, just in, in general, not even about Shield of the Oversoul specifically, but in, in general, um, building a deck that is encouraging you to commit, 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 commit to the board, um, you run the risk, if you're not careful, of getting blown out by board wipes. Or, you know, if, if, if Ural is to die somehow, which is more difficult than usual for creatures because he is hexproof, um, but if he was to die somehow, he would lose all of the enchantments, and you don't want to get caught with your pants down on like turn seven or eight after having you know cast Ural and committed some auras to him and you know used cards that are in your hand to do that. You don't want to be caught on those turns. Yeah you know, worst case scenario, turn eight say stuck at six mana with you know three cards in hand after a board wipe. Uh, bad situation, very hard to come back from that. So uh, the the first challenge in building a Ural deck is making sure you are protecting yourself, doing your due diligence to not get blown out. And Shield of the Oversoul doesn't... Well, I, I, I guess Indestructible is a pseudo way to help protect you from that nightmare blowout situation, but it's not a catch-all. Um, indestructible does not dodge like Toxic Deluge. It does not dodge merciless eviction lots of it does not dodge a cyclonic rift although i guess cyclonic rift would probably return the auras to your hand yeah so that would be okay but i, I digress there are lots of ways that uh you can still get blown out but still i mean uh, the stats on this card alone you're obviously going to be dedicating some deck slots to just auras and this one is a, this is a good one um as is armadillo cloak um it doesn't have it doesn't grant indestructible it doesn't help get you around um, potential blowouts, but life gain uh, on a big, big creature like Ural, who you're pretty sure is going to be dealing some damage either to an opponent or to their creatures. Um, you know, granting, I mean, this is not even lifelink. Um, important distinction between this and lifelink. This is just a, a, a triggered ability that effectively does the same thing, except these triggered abilities can stack. And they also stack w with lifelink, I guess. Um, lifelink, lifelink. If you somehow give a creature two instances of the keyword lifelink, it they don't. It doesn't do anything extra. It's just it, it changes the way that damage is dealt. It's not actually a trigger. Where this is a trigger. So even though it looks like maybe this would have been eroded to lifelink, it hasn't been. And so if you have say two armadillo cloaks, you gain twice as much life. Or if you have two armadillo cloaks and have granted lifelink. You gain three times as much, which can get out of hand pretty quickly. Uh, all that is to say, um, life gain in Ural is 
like it, it's it is pseudo replacing itself if you stretch your brain a little bit um, because if you gain 20 plus life not even beyond the realm of possibility in your role uh, that th those are extra turns that you are alive which is to say extra draw steps in, in a kind of roundabout way if you can reasonably expect to gain a lot of life lifelink is does replace itself kind of um, rancor Meanwhile, literally replaces itself. Normally when I say an enchantment replaces itself, what I am referring to is the, the words, when this enters the battlefield, draw a card. Um, Rancor doesn't say that. It just says that when it hits the graveyard, return it to its owner's hand. Like, normally when I say a card replaces itself, it means that it's replacing itself with some random card from the library. But Rancor is literally replacing itself <laughs> with itself. Um, you know, for the time it's on the battlefield, that is one fewer card in your hand. But... For Trample, which is excellent evasion for Ural, um, and, and, you know, plus four, plus two for one mana, hard to argue with that ratio. Um, Runes of the Deus, once again, you know, not doing anything to prevent you from getting blown out, but of course you're going to dedicate some deck slots to auras, and this is such a good one. Uh, presumably, you'll already have an aura of some sort on uh, Ural before you get to, you know, the five mana to cast this. Maybe not, but, you know, th this plus one other aura almost always gets you close to, if not in, one-shot territory, where you can knock out an opponent with 21 commander damage in one swing. So, uh, even though it doesn't replace itself and doesn't protect from blowouts, it's just so, so good that, of course, um, I like this card for Ural. Sram Senior Edificer. Uh, we call him a pseudo enchantress. More on that later. Um, Actually, more on that right now. Enchantresses are any creature or even enchantment that uh, let you draw cards anytime you cast and or play enchantments. Um, so this isn't quite uh, as... Well, in Ural, anyway, it's not quite as strong because it only applies to auras. And we do run some just regular enchantments in the Ural deck we'll be getting to in you know a little bit here. Um, but... You know, at two mana, you cast Sram, leave some mana up, and immediately cast an aura spell targeting your previously cast Ural, presumably. Uh, and he, he does immediately replace himself and potentially replace himself five, maybe ten times over if he stays in play for a good long time. So, Or if you just have a lot of open mana and auras in your hand. Uh, yeah, I like Sram quite a bit. Um, not quite as strong as Enchantresses, but uh, we'll get to those in a second. Spirit Mantle is the first card in Ural signature cards that I don't love. Obviously, protection from creatures just means unblockable and then some, but I don't... I mean, it's better to deal damage to opponents' faces, but even if they block, um, usually Ural will trample over, and um, killing a creature is not the worst thing in the world. It's just underwhelming Spirit Mantle compared to the auras we've seen before it. Yes, it gives plus three, plus three. It's a little bit of extra protection for Ural, but the Hexproof already takes care of, you know, any corner case creatures that might have uh, <laughs> an ability that couldn't target a creature with protection from creatures. But, um, yeah, I, I just, I think it's win more. I think you'd be better suited dedicating deck slots to control, card draw, ramp, or uh, other auras that maybe re replace themselves, right? It do this does not do anything at all to protect you from blowouts, and it's, it doesn't give enough of a stat boost, uh, in my opinion, to be worthy of a deck slot. Um, can't quite recommend it. Unflinching Courage, on the other hand, just because lifelink is so good, um, you, you don't want... You want, you want to be careful, I should say, that you don't run too many auras that all grant the same thing because when you're considering cards to put in a deck, you always want to consider the worst case scenario. And that would be, you know, drawing all four of your lifelink granting auras in the same hand some game. Lifelink doesn't stack. That doesn't gain you as much as it would. So you, you don't want to run too many. You want to spread out the evasion and keywords that your auras are granting to your. You don't want too many duplicates. But you know, life gain is just so so good. Um, it, it is pseudo replacing itself if it gains you twenty life because you can survive to an extra draw step. 
Mesa Enchantress. Okay, this is the archetype I was talking about of enchantresses, um, cards that draw you cards for playing enchantments. That's what she does. And uh, because of these cards' existence, uh, because white, red, green is a little hard-pressed for good card draw options, and because Ural is already pulling us, obviously, in an enchantment-heavy direction, uh, I have made the decision in my Ural deck to go all in and make it an enchantress. Uh, have enchantresses as the draw engine. I think that's a pretty common choice. I think it's pretty common sense. But yeah, I would I would almost go so far as to call this an auto-include. Maybe not if you think you have other ways to draw cards, but that's a pretty darn good way to draw cards in Ural. Hard to make a better argument for a different draw engine. Um, ethereal armor, I feel the same way as I did about, oh, I forget what it was even called. What was it called? Spirit Mantle. Right. Ethereal Armor, Spirit Mantle. Um, it doesn't do anything to replace itself. First Strike isn't... Uh, I, I don't know that it's relevant that often because Ural will just become so huge so quickly that you'll almost always have an opponent that you can swing at without enough damage on board to threaten Ural's existence. So I, I don't know that First Strike is the best... Uh, and well, and it's redundant with double strike. You'd rather give your old double strike, obviously. And uh, so that yeah, uh, eh. people often fall into the trap when deck building. I'm going to say this many times over the course of these uh, these uh, twelve episodes of EDH Rec Tech uh, of seeing abilities that are similar to their commander's abilities and thinking, oh, that must be good in this commander deck. And, and you know, sometimes that is the case, but uh, I think. More often than not, it's almost a disadvantage, right? Because your commander already does that thing, right? You don't need to dedicate a whole deck slot to doing that thing also because your commander does it. So, yeah, yeah I think it falls into win more a little bit. Um, I, I think there are better options than Ethereal Armor for Ural. Bear Umbra is very strong. It is almost out of the uh, price range that I have set for myself for these decks. I, I, I do not include in these decks any cards that cost more than $15. And at the time of recording this, I believe Bear Umbra is sitting somewhere at like $14.50. So if it doesn't see a reprint in the next, uh, <laughs> in the month between recording this and when this is going to go live, uh, it, it, it could dip above $15. So, but anyway, anyway, I'm, I'm, it's on the bubble there. But in terms of uh, what it does, not on the bubble, definitely in the deck. Um, not quite auto-include. Uh, it, it depends on what else you're doing ramp-wise. But totem armor alone is very strong um, because it helps protect you from getting blown out by board wipes. Uh, one of the few ways to actually deal with a hexproof commander, hexproof Voltron commander. Uh, so totem armor, instead of losing Ural and all auras on him, you just lose the bear umbro. Uh, and, and untapping all of your lands upon attack on a creature that you definitely want to be attacking, uh, very, very strong. It kind of doubles your mana. Uh, so, yeah, the really, yeah, no argument you can really make against Bear Umbra uh, other than it being four mana and maybe you want a tighter curve or something. I, I don't know. I, I like it a lot. Three Dreams... I think also you could consider close to an auto-include in Ural. Um, search your library for three aura cards and put them into your hand. Like, yeah, I mean, a, a five-mana draw three card spell isn't that over cost. I mean, at sorcery speed, you'd, you'd prefer for it to be an instant for five mana. But, like, that alone is not bad. And in a deck that is, you know probably wanting to draw into auras anyway, and especially if we include auras that can trip, right, that replace themselves, that draw us cards when we cast them, then, uh, yeah, I mean, this is just super, super, super good, super strong. Um, probably would lead to an opponent being knocked out that turn or the turn after. Um, Ancestral Mask. This reminds me of that other one. Wait, let's go, let's go back. Ethereal Armor. It's... Um, I don't know if it's better or worse than Ethereal Armor, but I, again, don't really like it. Um, Ural's most important number is 21, as in 21 commander damage. And this looks like it's... It, it, I mean, it's win more. It, it would help you get to, you know, 50 damage, which I guess is good if you're gaining life. Um, but, uh, again, I, I think you'd be better suited dedicating this card slot to card draw, control, or ramp. Um or just an aura that does a better job of replacing itself, therefore protecting you from getting blown out. Um, 
I mean, it can obviously make Ural huge, but you don't need Ural to get extra huger for more enchantments because he already does that well enough by himself. Don't need a dedicated deck slot. Unquestioned Authority, on the other hand, is... I mean, I think this should be, like, the number one signature card for Ural. I, mean, I, I don't know if number one, but it should be higher up than it is already, although I'm glad to see it showing up. Uh, because because it replaces itself. That, that, that's all I'm looking for in auras. I think y- y'all are overthinking it. Run any aura that replaces itself because Ural already gets plus two, plus two from it and is already a 5-5 five, five body. So al- even if it doesn't give any stat boost, you're still three swings from killing someone. I mean, assuming you can grant flying or something. Uh, well, if you grant protection from creatures with this, then you're going to get through three th- three swings until someone's dead uh, on a card that replaces itself, therefore protecting you from getting blown out, which is the biggest weakness potentially for Ural. Yes, yes, yes. Love this card. A- auto-include. This is an auto-include. Put this in your Ural deck. And uh, Eidolon of Blossoms, not, not a whole lot to say here. It's another Enchantress, uh, which is a great draw engine for a deck that wants to run lots of enchantments. So yes, definitely include Eidolon of Blossoms. And there you have it. Those are the signature cards. At least the cards that were signature cards when I recorded this. A few sets are liable to be coming out between now and uh, when this goes live. But, you know, a snapshot in time still helpful, I'm sure, for people thinking about playing a Ural deck or playing against a Ural deck and uh, all right all right all right let's 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 get to this deck tech let's get to the deck that I have built uh, it is called Earl the Mist Stalker let that sink in uh, it's an aggressive Voltron strategy with commander damage is the only win condition if you want to squint real hard and get super technical like I mean no it's not going to win any pods without killing people with Ural commander damage uh, the, you may, maybe you could get through with one one 40 times but uh, don't get blown out by board wipes ha <laughs> ha huh. huh. I've already been harping on this but just to reiterate prioritize enchantments that replace themselves the biggest potential weakness of Ural um, and we have of course as I've been saying an enchantress sub theme for card draw it is very powerful it is also a little bit fragile because most enchantresses have legs which uh, uh, I'm not trying... Uh, what am I saying here? Uh, what that means is they're stapled to creatures. Their ability is stapled to creatures, which makes them vulnerable uh, to board wipes or removal. Um, but they're also pretty cheap mana-wise. So if you can play an Enchantress and then immediately play an Aura or two, um, you will have already gotten your value off of them. Um, ideally, you're getting lots and lots of value off of them. Ideally, you can have three or four Enchantresses. I mean, that might be too much. Two or three Enchantresses in play, and then you cast two Auras, and you've drawn six cards, and life is pretty good for the Ural player. Um, for the neck I've built, here are the fundamentals. We have 18 ramp effects. That's in good territory. That's why that's green. Uh, in terms of draw, uh, we have... 12, an average amount, but like I said earlier, Enchantress draw engines can be super powerful uh, if you get them online, just a little bit fragile. Um, So I'm calling the draw average, but if you go off, it's really good. And the control suite uh, is also good. We have 17 control effects. Uh, They are often enchantment based, which means that they're not instant speed. You can only cast them during your main phase and they can be undone, right? Enchantments can be removed, which would bring right back whatever was underneath your oblivion ring. Uh, So, you know, not quite as good as like the options that blue black might have, but uh, yeah, enchantment themed control makes sense in an enchantress draw engine, Ural enchantment deck. Here's the game plan. We're going to ramp it to a turn four year old, right? A little ahead of curve. Then we're going to turn up the heat with a turn five aura on him. But some sort, I don't know what, something to make him big, fat, and scary. Then we're going to cast an enchantress or two. We're going to keep drawing cards. We're going to keep ramping. We're going to keep attacking. And we're going to hold up removal effects until we have destroyed the will of our opponents and their life totals, too. Um, we're going to get to the, the, the real deck in just a second. But before we do... Have you ever wanted to put some bread in my pocket while putting some cards in your trade binder? Well, if so, check out FlipSideGaming.com. They're just like a, an LGS up in New York, I guess, but they're trying to build out like an online store, and they reached out to me, and bada bing, bada boom. I'm like, I could put uh, this in my videos and make a little bit of money uh, if you buy your next batch of Magic cards from them and use the promo code POGO. Uh, that would be super cool. Help, help me continue to make content like this. Um, also... 
want to get ahead of a criticism of the uh, deck building that I'm going to be doing over the next uh, 11 weeks here. Uh, building off of the EDH rec page for a given commander naturally lends itself to top-down design, right? You start with the commander and then fill out the deck from there, uh, which, you know, also lends itself a little bit to, like, generic good stuff strategies. Uh, so I, I, I want to prove to you eventually that uh, I'm not just a one-trick pony, all right? I can do bottom-up deck building. What do I mean by that? I mean, like, pick two cards that have a really unique, cool, like, way of interacting with each other. And and send me that. Tell me about those two cards. Uh, DanBrownUniverse at gmail.com. You, do, you don't even have to tell me the commander you think that uh, those cards should be in the 99 for. Uh, I'll do that. I'll figure out the shell for the synergy that you like, and we'll do a little bit of bottom-up deck building probably at the end of the year here. Like this is EDH Rec Tech is the show in town for the next eleven weeks, but uh, after that, you know who knows? Who knows? Maybe we'll go straight into that. Uh, DanBrownUniverse at gmail.com. All right, let's look at this. Let's look at Earl. Earl. We'll start with the mana base here. Uh, Thirty-eight lands, pretty normal number. Bant Panorama is the first in alphabetical order, and you might be saying, Dan, you're not running blue, why do you need to fetch up an island? The answer is we don't, but I feel like three color decks are kind of the Goldilocks zone for these uh, panoramas. They enter untapped and can produce a colorless, and in three mana or in three colors, that usually won't bite us. That, that is to say, you know, not being able to tap it for a color. Um, and sometimes it is very relevant that we're able to search between either a plains or a forest. You know, the island might not be relevant, but searching for two land that enters untapped in a deck that, you know, we're, we're trying to yeah, have some semblance of a budget here. No card costs more than $15. Uh, perfectly viable option to run these panoramas, I think, in three color decks, even if uh, it's not exactly the three colors. If you have, even if we only have two out of three hits, as it were. Um, Battlefield Forge, totally normal uh, pain land. I like pain lands. I'm just having an even distribution in here of the colors between the miscellaneous, like, you know, two color lands I have. Blighted Woodland is a ramp spell stapled to a land like that a lot. Uh, Boros Garrison, not the best. Uh, if you have shock lands, fetch lands, dual lands, uh, it might be better to put that in here instead of this. But uh, don't hate the bounce lands because they're kind of like two land drops in one. They just cost you some tempo. Yeah, two lands in one because it bounces land to your hands, so you're guaranteed to have a land drop next turn, right? Um, but costs you tempo, it enters tapped, and then it uh, can put you in awkward situations where you have eight cards in hand at end of turn if you play this on, like, turn two. Uh, if, if you play this before you've played any spells for the game, really, like, that can happen as late as turn three or four sometimes. Uh, so, yeah, that's why I don't like them. But, uh, yeah, they're playable. They're definitely playable. I'm definitely playing it here. <laughs> uh, Brushland, Painland, Checklands are good. Command Tower in any deck with more than two colors. Contested Cliffs is crazy in Ural. If you have a Ural deck and don't have this card in it, change that. You get a few non-basic land slots uh, that don't do anything to help you with color fixing, but just have some upside in a three-color deck. You definitely can afford a few of these, and this one should be number one. Uh, Ural is a beast. Like, literally, his creature type is beast. And being able to basically remove an opponent's creature, let's be honest, Ural will likely be the biggest creature on board once per turn and if Ural has like lifelink or something goodness it gets out of hand very quickly very good card uh Carpluzen forest is just a pain land jungle shrine is a three color tap land in our colors jun panorama same thing as bant panorama totally fine to play another bounce land you could maybe do better but you could also do worse uh, we run some basics for forests kessig wolf run not as good as contested cliffs but again you get a few deck slots to non-basic lands that don't help you color fix at all, but just have some other upside, and this is a pretty good upside. You know, this could be the difference between your all uh, having lethal or not having lethal in a given turn. Very, very good. Uh, Crows and Verge. Enters tapped. We don't love it, but it is a ramp spell stapled to a land, so that's that's pretty darn good, especially a two-mana ramp spell. Um, worth it entering tapped. Four mountains. We have a panorama that's actually in all three of our colors, so it's even better. Uh, we have four planes. Rugged Prairie, uh, some in this cycle are more than $15. I think that's just contingent on what's going on in other constructed formats. Uh, but this one is uh, cheaper, so you know every once in a while I'll dip into these 
other two color untapped land archetypes uh rootbound crag check land totally fine rogue's passage uh you know earl will often have evasion already but in case he doesn't not the worst thing to uh, guarantee that he gets through, or if your opponents have, like, flying blockers. Reliquary Tower doesn't hurt. Reflecting Pool taps for any color. Very good in a three-color deck. Uh, scattered Groves. Uh, you know, cycling on a land late in the game when you have a lot of lands already in hand. Uh, not bad. Or if you just have a lot of lands early in the game, it can help uh, un otherwise unkeepable hands actually be keepable. Uh, Sun Home giving Double Strike to Ural. My goodness, on a stick, you can do it over and over. It's like this. That's good. That could be the difference between winning and not winning the game. And all for zero mana because it's on a land that enters untapped for a colorless anyway. Wow. Sun Petal Grove, uh, check land. And these last three temples, they enter tapped. Uh, but if you're going to, you can have a few lands enter tapped in a deck, uh, you know, especially in a battle cruiser meta game it's not going to matter so much uh you know if you have better lands like shocks fetches duels then of course uh run those instead but you know it, it, these are better than lands that are tapped that only gain you like a life say that's not that good uh scrying one is better so i prefer these and they synergize a little bit with the um boros garrison and gruel turf the bounce lands you can get multiple scries i mean in exchange for all of those lands entering tapped, it's a big tempo loss, but sometimes that scry in the long run winds up being worth it. Taking a look at Ural's ramp suite, we have 18 ramp effects total. Uh, many of them are mana rocks here with a strong emphasis on two mana mana rocks. When I'm building decks for battle cruiser punchy games of EDH, two mana mana rocks are magical. That's exactly where you want them to be. Borrow Signet, two mana. Commander Sphere, I mean, three mana, but uh, you can sack it to draw a card. It replaces itself in a pinch. It's pretty good. Felwar Stone, two mana mana rock, two mana mana rock, two mana mana rock that might replace itself. Uh, two mana mana rock, two mana mana rock, two mana mana rock. Uh, Soul Ring, pretty good card. If you've never heard of it, you should probably run this in every single deck. Two mana mana rock, Selesnia Signet. Let's look at these enchantments. Now, obviously, we have a heavy premium in Ural to run enchantment-based ramp because of our Enchantress sub-theme. If we have an Enchantress or two out, this will draw us a card or two, or maybe three. Uh, so this is also a two-mana ramp spell, which is the sweet spot for where we want it on our curve. But with, like, Gift of, Gift of Paradise here, it's okay if it costs three mana because it is also an enchantment. And if we have an Enchantress, it is also drawing us cards. Mana Bloom, uh, if you saw my Ramos deck tech, uh, I like this in more decks than you might think. It's an easy card to overlook, but uh, in the early game, it is kind of a two-mana ramp spell yes you lose tempo it goes back to your hand you have to recast it but in an enchantress deck going back to your hand is a feature not a bug it's recast it draw more cards uh you can also drop it turn two just to ramp yourself a little bit quicker into whatever you're trying to do mid game uh, sheltered airy same thing as gift of paradise it's a three mana enchantment ramp uh so the enchantment effect it draws cards for us wild growth super good one mana weirding wood i was also talking about this i believe in my ramos deck tech uh very very good it draws cards, it replaces itself, it ramps, it is everything we want. Verdant Haven, enchantment, it's at three mana, but, you know, uh, it is an enchantment. And Trace of Abundance, this is great. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's another enchantment, cantrips with enchantresses, and it only costs two mana to ramp. Super duper. Those are our ramp effects. Taking a look at Ural's uh, draw suite. These are the ways we have to draw cards. Twelve uh, things in this deck are exclusively dedicated, or more than anything else dedicated, I should say, to uh, trying to keep our hand full. First of all, we have a suite of enchantresses and Sram, who's hanging out there with them. He's with, with them. He's kind of an enchantress. Our Grothian enchantress, uh, yeah, whenever you cast an enchantment spell, draw a card. Eidolon of Blossoms, almost the same thing. It's just whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield, you draw a card. But worthy of note on this one is that it... Uh, replaces itself as soon as you cast it as opposed to enchantresses where you have to wait for another enchantment so you know costs more mana but maybe is better uh, in other ways mesa enchantress that's just whenever you cast sram is whenever you cast an aura i don't think this deck has any equipments or vehicles maybe an equipment i don't i don't even know uh but <laughs> yeah we still run so many auras because they synergize so well with ural not to mention some of our removal package are um i believe auras 
uh, but we'll get to that in a second. Uh, Verdurian Enchantress, or Verdurian Enchantress, same thing. Um, we also have Enchantress's Presence right here. Same thing, it's just on an enchantment instead of a creature. Um, so th that's our primary draw engine. We have six effects that, you know, can turn enchantments into cantrips or if we get two of them in play then they're like divinations if we get three of them in play then it's just busted then we're just drawing and drawing and drawing and we will probably uh, find ourselves in a very advantageous position shortly thereafter um, but yeah like I said a little fragile they can die to board wipes um, so you want to uh, try try to ensure that you can get immediate value off of whatever enchantress you are playing um you know wait until you also have an enchantment in hand and can follow up immediately after playing the enchantress to draw that card right away so that you're guaranteed to replace itself but uh yeah if, if they stay on the board for a while it can turn into a very very strong draw engine um then we also have sage's reverie here i mean this deck just um, is highly incentivized to play enchantments, obviously. Uh, and this, you know, the boost to Ural can be substantial, I suppose, but that's not the reason we run it. Like, it doesn't grant any evasion, but it draws us cards. It draws us, you know, in a late game board state, this can draw you four or five cards. Uh, and otherwise, it's drawing you, you know, one or two or three. Eh, still not bad. Three cards for four mana is still a pretty good ratio. Garrick, Primal Hunter. He's in here mainly for his minus three. Ural will likely be very strong, very fast, easy to get him up to 10 power. So five mana to draw 10 plus cards is not bad on a Garrick, even if he leaves the battlefield right away, even if you're treating him just like a sorcery. Not bad. Speaking of sorceries, Harmonize, four mana for three cards, pretty good ratio. Rishkar's Expertise, similar to Garrick's ability, uh, draws his cards equal to the greatest power, and it lets us cast another. I love this card. This is... Uh, yeah, I think I think we can consider this an EDH staple from Kaladesh block. Pretty darn good. Soul's Majesty, uh, yeah, same idea. It doesn't get you a free cast, but also costs one less mana than Rishkar's, so very good. And then three dreams here. I mean, I, I guess it's not technically a draw effect, but it's like better than that, right? You're probably hoping to draw into some sort of potent aura anyway. And so searching your library for three, three cards for five mana is still not a bad ratio. Uh, the fact that you're tutoring them straight up is very very strong here we have Ural's control suite uh, it's not quite as dynamic as other control suites you're liable to see I mean definitely not as dynamic as Ramos and uh, probably less than average um, for uh, most of the decks here on EDH Rec Tech. That's not because of the number per se. We do run 17 control effects. It's just that in these colors, you know, we are a little bit hard pressed uh, for instant speed answers. The answers that we do have uh, at sorcery speed um, in enchantments, which are we are very heavily incentivized to do because of our draw engine uh, being enchantresses, uh, they, they do tend to be relatively universal answers. They tend to be applicable to like the most commonly threatening like card types uh, but yeah they are a little bit slow and they are a little bit fragile you can blow up uh, banishing light say <laughs> first one here and whatever you have exiled will then come back but the the flip side of that is if we have an enchantress or two online this is drawing us a card or two while dealing with an opponent's threat uh, it can be very strong in that situation um, cartouche of strength uh, one grants the Ural bonus to Ural, the additional plus two plus two. The trample is relevant here, and the fact that it has Ural fight. I mean, usually he's going to be the biggest thing on the board, so he should win any fight pretty easily. Uh, almost every other creature should be a viable target, unless they have, like, Death Touch or something. That would be annoying, wouldn't it? Anyway, Faith Unbroken. Uh, it gives a boost, a plus four plus four boost to Ural, if you factor in Ural's plus two plus two we give himself and it's like an oblivion ring for a creature anyway uh exile an opponent's creature until this leaves yeah pretty good grasp of fate uh it's like an oblivion ring but for every opponent pretty good stasis snare uh, it's like a oblivion ring for creatures that has flash so it is an instant speed answer only hits creatures but hits any creature not too bad can be undone but at the very least is a tempo play song of the dryads i like this a lot it's a way to pseudo permanently deal with a commander post tuck rule change right if you enchant a commander and turn it into a forest that's not it's not changing zones right they can't redirect it to the command zone it just turns into a tree it's a pretty effective way to uh, neutralize a, a problem commander or just any permanent in a pinch 
you can turn a different permanent of yours into a forest if you want a ramp or something. I don't know. Song of the Dryads, uh, very good, especially in a deck incentivized to play lots of enchantments. Oblivion Ring, kind of the gold standard here. Um, hits any non-land permanent. Sorcery Speed is an enchantment, so it can be undone. Journey to Nowhere, again, just, yeah, very good. A no-ring that only hits creatures, but for two mana, you know, in a deck that wants to be playing enchantments anyway, pretty good. That's our enchantment-based removal. Let's take a look at our instants. Um, afterlife here. I mean, it's instant speed and hits any creature. It can't be regenerated. Isn't so relevant. Uh, the, the, the more time passes, the more it seems that Wizards is replacing regeneration with just like indestructible. Uh, so that, that those words aren't as relevant here. And the one one spirit, whatever. This is a forty life format. Uh, destroys any creature. Instant speed. Not too bad. Beast within. Uh, arguably the best removal spell in Commander. Chaos Warp is the only one that might also be as good. Uh, they're just super good. You should run them both. Crib Swap exiles any creature. Uh, giving a 1-1 Shapeshifter really doesn't matter that much. This is better than Afterlife. Afterlife is basically a second copy, a second slightly worse copy of Crib Swap. This is, uh, yeah, this is good in colors that are a little hard-pressed for instant speed answers. Valorous Stance. Um, both modes are very relevant. We sometimes might want to protect Ural from board wipes. Um, I don't know that we have a whole lot else that could grant Ural indestructible in the deck, uh, so that's good. But more often than not, you'll probably be destroying a big scary creature of an opponent's. Swords to Plowshares. Classic. Path to Exile. Also classic, although a little more expensive. Maybe they could reprint it again. It would be really nice. Ablation. I spoke about this um, in my Ramos deck tech. I like this card. It is... Did I speak about this in my Ramos deck tech? I forget. Maybe I didn't. I like this card. Ablation hits any non-land permanent and drawing two cards for your opponents in a multiplayer format is not as bad as it would be in a one-on-one -on -one situation because you kind of have to divide the card disadvantage that is by the number of opponents you have. That math is not exact. Like, if the opponent that's drawing the cards is your biggest threat, you might not want to just give them two cards. But if it's unclear who the arch enemy is and someone has a scary permanent that needs to be dealt with, Oblation is a, a great way to deal with it. And in a pinch, you can Oblate <laughs> your own permanent to draw two cards if you really need to. Uh, and then finally here we have a Sorcery, Divine Reckoning. Oh, wow, it destroys... All but one creature for each player, and you can do it twice. Seems pretty good in a deck built around one really scary creature. <laughs> Any Voltron strategy in white, this seems like a, a natural include. And finally, here we have uh, what I call Ural's Clothes. These are the auras that you can put on him to uh, give him an extra boost and make him big and scary uh, and give him evasion and... These can trip and replace themselves like, all right, my advice in every deck, don't overbuild around whatever it is that your commander does. Like, just because your old loves auras doesn't mean that you need to run 25 of them, right? It would be better to run, you know, you, you need a critical mass. You need, you, you know, you need, this is probably close to like the minimum, you know, 12 to 15 it would be the minimum, but I'd say 20 would be about the maximum you want uh, before you start having diminishing returns and you wouldn't just be better suited playing more of the fundamentals, ramp, card draw, and control. Um, but so uh, let's take a look at these one at a time, alphabetical order, uh, angelic gift. Uh, it's in there because it grants evasion and it draws us a card. I mean, Ural starts as a 5-5, five, five, so he's already a 7-7 seven, seven flying as soon as this hits. And it gives him evasion. That's three-shot kill territory. Like, you know, you avoid being blown out by having auras that replace themselves. And Angelic Gift does that. Everything else is just a bonus, right? Ural already gets a boost from any aura regardless of what it does. You know, he gets a boost from pacifism. <laughs> kind of. Uh, anyway. Armadillo Cloak. Uh, you know, so plus four, plus four. Trample and Pseudo Lifelink. I was talking about this in the signature cards. Very good. Doesn't replace itself, but that's okay. Chosen by Heliod does replace itself. The stat boost is incidental. It's just an enchantment that we cast. It grants plus two, plus four, replaces itself, and maybe replaces itself again and again because of an enchantress and maybe another enchantress. Dragon Mantle, again, it replaces itself. 
and maybe it replaces itself multiple times over. Imagine casting this with two enchantresses in play. That's an ancestral recall that gives a creature plus two, plus two, and fire breathing. What? In red? That's unheard of. Dragon Man... Uh, yeah, just... Re- ah, the most important thing is re- to have these replace themselves and not get blown out. Uh, Dragon Man is very good, especially if you can give, like, double strike somehow to Ural. Man, man, man. Super, super, super. Duper, duper, duper. Rancor. Uh, I was talking about this at the beginning of the video and the signature cards. Very good. I like it. Griff's Boon. Pseudo replaces itself by returning to play from the graveyard uh, for four mana. And it grants evasion. Like, we care more about evasion than any stat boost. The plus one plus zero doesn't matter. But the evasion and the fact that it can recur itself and that it's only one mana uh, to cast from hand is very, very strong, especially with an enchantress or two in play. Uh, flicker form, uh, uh, kind of, uh, y- y- you kind of have to if you're running a Voltron strategy in white uh, that is based around enchantments. It's just a way to keep you're all safe and all of your enchantments safe and if you get into the battlefield triggers for auras coming back you get one for each so <laughs> this plus enchantress is, is crazy they all come back i guess unless you're dealing with an enchantress that is off of a cast but this plus like the eidolon of blossoms would be crazy they all come back and these enchantments these auras that uh say draw a card when they enter the battlefield just on the card text itself very good with flicker form. Felidar Umbra. I like totem armor. I haven't gone too far in... I, mean, I think that there are two ways to grant totem armor in this deck. But I I like that a lot. Um, lifelink is important for Ural. You don't want to have too many effects that grant lifelink because you run the risk of it becoming redundant. But um, lifelink and totem armor... And the fact that you can flip this... I mean, I don't know how many other creatures are really even going to be viable targets. But that you could pseudo-protect this by flipping it onto another creature uh, seems pretty good. Runes of the Deus, I was talking about in the signature cards. Very good. Tracy is also home. How's it going, Tracy? Good, how are you? Not too bad. Just uh, recording the deck tech here. You can probably hear my dog now, too. Yeah, life's pretty Life's pretty good at home. Life's pretty good here. Tracy got home from work, and I'm just uh, working on deck techs. All right, we're going to keep going. Runes of the Deus, very good. Already, sp- already spoke about this. Uh, Scourge of the Nobilis grants fire breathing and lifelink and plus four, plus four, if you include Ural's uh, boost for all for three mana. Just too good to pass up. It's not card advantage. It doesn't replace itself, but that's okay. Shield of the Oversoul. Pseudo card advantage insofar as it grants indestructible. Already spoke about this one. Here's another instance of Totem Armor. Totem Armor by itself pseudo replaces itself by just like protecting a creature from what would be lethal damage, especially when you've invested so much into that creature by way of auras. Um, But this also just replaces itself by literally replacing itself. Whenever this creature deals damage to an opponent, draw a card. Get a couple swings in with it. Very much worth the deck slot. Spirit Loop. I mean, it, it grants pseudo lifelink. This has not been errated to lifelink, so this would be a triggered ability. So it does stack. So this plus Armadillo Cloak plus um, Felidar Umbra would be triple life gain per damage. Uh, and uh, it replaces itself literally when it is put into a graveyard. You just put it back in your hand. Very, very good, especially with enchantresses, especially if you're drawing cards on cast or on entering the battlefield. And then uh, finally, we have Unquestioned Authority. Already shared with you how much I love this card in the signature cards, but it is very good. Auto include in any Ural deck, in my opinion. Take a peek at how Earl does it. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Uh, draw our opening hand. We have a Thought Vessel, which is a ramp effect. We have three lands um, although it's going to be <laughs> difficult to get any of them to enter untapped. Temple's automatically under tapped and the clifftop retreat right now we don't have a mountain or a plains in hand that said um, we do have two yeah, forms of ramp. The Trace of Abundance I overlooked a second ago but it's pretty good and the Scourge of the Nobilis is decent so uh, ah yeah I like, I think that we keep this hand. I think that we'd be kicking ourselves if we wound up mulliganing down to six and, and kept, like, a, an iffy hand at that point because this hand is solid. Um, just one place where lands entering tapped can sometimes be a bit of a pain. But let's see if we don't see if we don't draw land here. Oh, hey, look at that, a land that enters untapped. 
Uh, I will main phase, play a Temple of Plenty, and we will scry one. There's a Valorous Stance. Uh, removal effect. Um, I'm on the fence about this. What I really want is card draw. Uh, so I am going to move that to the bottom of my library. We're digging for card draw. Um, go to turn two, untap, draw. There's a Commander's Fear. Uh, we'll play that Contested Cliffs, and then for two, um, we'll drop a Thought Vessel. I suppose that playing Cliffs into Thought Vessel here doesn't get us any closer to dropping this Trace of Abundance, because it requires two colored mana, and next turn we still, I believe, don't have a way to generate that, even if we play a Commander Sphere. So we'd have to draw into another land, but um, that's okay. Commander Sphere uh, can replace Trace of Abundance, and we can hopefully play... Yeah, then we could definitely play Trace of Abundance the following turn, so not really a huge loss. Um, turn three. I guess I already untapped. Oh, hey, and there's a Rugged Prairie, so uh, now I need to think about it for a second. Probably makes the most sense to play the Rugged Prairie, right? Because then we would have one, two, three, four mana that could tap into a Trace of Abundance which would still then be three mana, which would be enough to drop a Commander Sphere and hold up a path to exile, right? Did I do that right? Play a Rugged Prairie, and then for... Yeah, oh, oh, that is awkward, actually, because the Rugged Prairie can only make red-white, which is not what we need to play the Trace of Abundance. Oh, dear, huh. So what is the best thing to do here? Instead, if we go... Well, we can play both. We just can't hold up a path to exile, which on turn three is probably fine. Uh, if we do three like that, we can play a Commander Sphere. And then this plus green is a trace of abundance that I suppose... Um, let's go ahead and put it on the Temple of Plenty. That seems to make the most sense. Going into turn four, not a bad spot to be in. Untap, draw, chosen by Heliod. I like that. We have one, two, three, four, five, six mana, enough to cast Girl and hold up Path to Exile. Um, there's no way to make another mana. Again, still awkward that these lands enter tapped, but we'll we'll deal with it. I mean, Earl wouldn't have haste in the first place, right? Scourge does not grant haste, does it? No. So, um, yeah, no, no real loss here. So one, two, um, three, four, filtering for five. Uh, we will play, play Ural, the Mist Stalker, holding up one mana for a path to exile. Uh, usually we wouldn't need to use this so early. I wouldn't think especially with a 5-5 five, five blocker out there. So um, I'm going to say we don't. Turn five, untap, draw, three dreams. Very interesting. Oh, I missed a land drop last turn, too. Let's say I did that. If I saw three dreams on top, probably would have left it. Uh, so we have this also. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven mana. You're all the Mist Stalker. Um, <laughs> and the potential to drop a Chosen by Heliod and a Scourge of the Noblest. Let's do the Chosen by Heliod first. Mm, one, two mana? Yeah, one, two mana. Use our artifacts first. Chosen by Heliod gets plus O oh, plus two. We will attach it to Ural. Uh, when it enters, we also draw a card. That draw is Song of the Dryads. Very interesting. So Ural is now a seven, nine. Okay. Chosen by Heliod replacing itself, making it very strong. Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five mana left. Um, we have one land drop left also. Let's go ahead and say for one, two, three. Well, yeah, so, so okay, important to point out what our other option would be. We could use Contested Cliffs to make Ural fight a creature and then punch through for seven, which is, you know, a, a three-shot kill range. Um, I think in most cases on turn five, we would still have an opponent without a blocker. Um, and even if they did have a blocker, uh, it, it would be worth it to swing for the lifelink granted from Scourge of the Noblest. So probably not the best play to use Contested Cliffs, but of course depends on 
the board state. Uh, so for one, two, three, go ahead. Eh, you know what? Let's do one, two, three like that. I think that's a little more versatile. Uh, cast Scourge of the Noblest. We will attach it to Ural. It grants plus four, plus four when you factor in Ural. So that's going to bring him up to 11, 12. Uh, sorry, there's a 7, 9, so it's going to be 11, 13. 11, 13. And he's attacking. We're going to move to combat, and we're in two shot territory, and we're going to gain 11 life. Go up to 51. Pretty good. He's probably not going to die with 13 toughness. And uh, I guess we could make him too bigger, although probably better to hold up a path to exile. Non zero chance that we have to fire it off here because we don't have a blocker. Uh, you know, we, we probably still don't, but let's just be conservative and say that we do. We'll move to turn six, untap, draw. Uh, again, I forgot a land drop last turn, so let's say I just played that. Uh, doesn't really matter. Ooh, and our draw is Garrick. Primal Hunter seems pretty okay with an 11 13 out there. Uh, one green green for yeah five we don't have the mana for that I mean maybe we could have the mana for that but um, yeah you know what? let's leave it up uh, Garrick and we'll be treating Garrick like a sorcery so I'll just put him right in the graveyard and draw one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven cards <laughs> that feels pretty good turn six an 11 13 Ural swinging for lethal commander damage on an opponent. Um, we still have two mana up and a land drop to go. We can, and we have a soul ring in our hand. Let me just take stock of what we're even doing. So I wouldn't be able to grant double strike this turn. Uh, oh, or would we? Goodness gracious. If we tap the contested cliffs for a soul ring, then drop the sun home, then we would have Four plus tapping Sun Home to grant double strike to Ural. Um, seems okay. That seems okay. I mean, on turn six, many of our opponents likely have blockers. We could also do a Spirit Loop to grant like double Life Link. Right, this one's a triggered ability. You know, at this point, uh, it, it doesn't really make sense for me to continue Gold Fishing because it, it's so contingent on what is happening on the board. Maybe instead we play. Um, you know, a land, we, we could do, you know, Wolf Run into Soul Ring, into Signet, into Contested Cliffs, right? Into Fighting, into Swinging for Lethal, and gaining 11 more life. Um, but yeah, so th th this is a pretty representative game too. Like, Ural is super explosive all the time, you know, uh, whether or not you get your Enchantress Engine online. You know, Garrick was enough to draw 11 cards on turn 6. Like, very, very strong deck. Uh, very, very strong commander. I, 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 I recommend building him in a way similar to this. You will enjoy the results. I am confident in your Battlecruiser metagame. Anyway, that's all for EDH Rec Tech. Uh, we'll be back next week. Same time, same place. Pogo Back Gaming. Be sure to subscribe. Check out all the links in the description. And uh, call your mother. She's, she hasn't heard from you in a week. And would love to hear from you, I am sure. Okay, that's how we end these videos. I'm Dan Brown, and good